was a great story. He really got out of that one. Hello, and welcome back to Time Travel Comic. What do you do when it's a rainy day? You stay inside and read some great comic books. And also, time travel. Today we're going to explore a different theme that's going to include looking out into space. Looking through the window like I did when I found out that it was raining. And viewing and seeing what there is to behold and see. One of the best examples I could think of was watching Star Trek The Next Generation when Captain Picard, after a long mission and an enduring quest, would look out the window to gaze upon the stars. And it's interesting that this theme comes up a lot in a lot of comic books. And today we're going to take a look at a few windows into space. But of course, we're going to use our time machine and travel to the different books to explore them as well. So hang on everybody, let's go. And now the first book we'll take a look at is the Bell Four Color series, uh, number 378. And we're greeted by a beautiful blue cover with the moon in the uh, background and a space theme here. And it's from February of 1952. And you can see how the thought was back then, how the technology looked with the metal design, the rounded, uh, looks to it, and this is a beautiful view to space, uh, centering on the character Tom Corbett, and he was an astronaut with a group of cadets uh, who would go out and explore and report back to their captain, and a great adventure. The painting-like cover is by Al McWilliams, who oftentimes uh, designed the Bell Space Cadet covers. And it's uh, just a nice sight to behold. It takes place in the year uh, 2351. As the Captain Strong and his three space cadet, uh, Tom Corbett, of course, Astro, and Roger Manning, uh, take on another adventure. So here they're planning and talking about it. And then they make their way out into space to encounter all kind of things. Sometimes their explorations don't go quite as planned and they have to figure it out. And usually Tom Corbett has the answer. It always impresses Captain Strong, who's the leader of the pack. You can see the artwork inside. Again, problem solving in space. See the rockets up and down. In the 1950s, the idea of space travel was becoming real and alive and something that was expected to take off and continue to take off well into the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. And uh, it was quite a, quite a fantasy, quite an outlook. And keeping to our view into space, you can see using the viewfinder there, looking at incoming rockets, aliens. Now's the time to go a good time to strike so it's always exciting to see what they were thinking back in 1952 look at the blazing afterburners of the rocket the rings of saturn in the background this was uh, a thrill just to see all that action just whizzing by the planet look at the angles here you can see the contour of the chin the rockets uh, attacking, the space cadets thinking quickly here, the aliens around there. There's the viewfinder again, looking into space, and uh, even a little bit of information about Mars. This is an actual picture from the American Museum of Natural History that also included, aside from the comic book uh, cartoon, uh, some factual description. Look at that. And uh, let's take a moment to look at this wraparound cover. Not quite wraparound, but you can see space and its finest. Thank you, Tom Corbett, and the Dull Four Color series for this nice Golden Age book. Now I'm going to move this one aside as we have this beautiful blue cover. Let's second it with another beautiful blue cover. And just look how close they look and resemble. 
The one on the right, Weird Fantasy by UC Comics, this is a replica, and it's a replica of a book that was printed in September, October of 1950, whereas uh, Space Cadet came out a couple years later in 1952. So I wonder if there's some similarities. There's a little bit of an uncanny resemblance. Uh, maybe Space Cadet drew its inspiration from uh, EC Comics and Weird Fantasy. But at any rate, another beautiful cover, a view into space, looking at a moon-like planet or the moon itself. Actually, it says moon right there, so it is. And we have our astronauts toiling and tinkering at the controls, looking uh, and seeing what they can do. Destination is the moon. So this is a great reproduction. They're still out there, and they're pretty cheap. And it's from 1992 uh, from Russ Cochran and Gemstone Publishers. So they're reprints of uh, the older books from the 1950s, Weird Fantasy Number 3. And this is an Albert Feldstein cover. His name is right over here. Feldstein and that nice uh, deco-like, very elegant uh, signature on the bottom. And... Again, the, the theory is about space travel. It's about looking into space. We're looking again at whizzing rockets. It's a theme I like. I've always liked science fiction, and I always like the portrayal of rocket ships and how they look. And, of course, government agents talking with astronauts and missions to be created. Uh, scientists are sabotaging and tinkering again. And... and uh, Weird Fantasy and EC Comics has a rich history because Wally Wood was involved in this too. Uh, he was also involved in creating some of the artwork of various stories. Uh, also, we have Harvey Kurtzman who wrote the story. Harvey Kurtzman created a lot of these interesting stories. Uh, Jack Kamen, Wally Wood again. It's just, just great to see that that kind of look and the expressions and the faces and a lot of writing. You can see a lot in the comic bubbles, a lot of description, panel by panel, action, gunfights. So this one's not really related to space, but this one is the dark side of the moon. And you can see an alien-like ghost character holding a moon. And there's Wally Wood's signature on the bottom. So just look at the creativity, and that's what made Wally Wood such a great artist. Wow, just look at that, like a dream sequence. Looking at the viewfinder, looking outside to see what's happening, what's going on in space, making calculations, whizzing rockets. So it's, uh, this is the reproduction. You could see some other ones too, like Tales of the Crypt. If you ever go to your comic book store and they have a few of these uh, lying around, they're really good to pick up these uh, reproduction by Russ Cochran Gemstone right here. So Weird Fantasy number three, a reproduction of September, October 1950. As our time machine ticks away, we're going to look at a Charlton book. And here we are with this red-orange cover. From Space Adventures, number 53, from September of 1963. And right away, we're greeted with a lot of action, a lot of tension and intimidation here. As looking through into space through the visor, we're greeted by these yellow wolf-like characters approaching a spacecraft. They have weapons here. There's a rocket in the background, stars in the, in the space and, be, and behind them. And look at the crew trying to check the control panels again, like we've seen in the last covers. The crew is looking on to plan their next move as these in, these uh, invader people come right up to them. And and even the lady here, you can see the distress and the, the trauma of like how, what she's feeling right now. And this book was actually introduced to me by uh, Captain Strange Life uh, before I picked up my own copy as he had it in one of his videos. And the artwork is by Bill Montez and Ernie Bach, as uh, it's signed right here. 
and just quite a color. The use the artist's use of using the red to kind of blend in everything, and where our eyes are taken right to the action, right into the visor, looking into space and seeing what's happening there. So a few short stories are in here. Again, we're greeted by whizzing rockets and flying saucers, always a, a favorite theme of mine. And we can see the artwork, and usually it's about an evil tyrant contemplating what to do and to create havoc. And of course, the heroes have to figure out uh, what to do and hope for a happy ending, as we could see on the bottom. Looking through the pages, we have that recognizable artwork by two particular artists, Charles Nicholas and Vince Alasia. And one of the stories even has her signature. Uh, in. Let's see if I could find that. And here it is. It's uh, Charles Nicholas and Alicia written right over there, as we can see. And simple line work, not a lot of contour. You don't see that dark shading and, and such. But it, it makes for some good composition. And what's interesting to note is that the Charles uh, Nicholas, uh, his name is really a pseudonym for the uh, house that he worked for, a group of artists, uh, Chuck Quidera, Char Charles Wojcikowski, and, and even Jack Kirby. For a short run, uh, Jack Kirby used the pseudonym of the Charles Nicholas when he did the Blue Beetle. So it was kind of inspired by the uh, comic book house, like the uh, Eager comic uh, production, and Eager Studios, as well as Eisner Studios, com were comprised of a lot of artists that were not recognized independently, but rather as a group. It wasn't until later that they were independently named. There you have it. Thank you, Space Adventures, number 53. View into space, and that's a beauty. And why don't we take a look at a, another Charlton book? And this one's Outer Space, and behold, another cover looking outside this window right here. And a uh, large head, the alien looking in, almost makes the astronaut look miniature. And this is Outer Space. This is from December 1958. And it happens to be issue number 20 from uh, the third volume. See all the gears and contraps in it. And I just like looking at the other covers, how they have those gears and the bottom and kind of the control panel, if you will, just like we saw here. And just like we saw from our first cover. Just It's fun to see that uh, dynamic of, of their spaceship in the interior. And we're greeted by a beautiful Dick Giordano cover. As we talked about before, Vince Alicia, Charles Nicholas, and Dick Giordano, they were the heavy hitters uh, with Charlton. And eventually, most of them made their way to uh, DC Comics uh, a little bit later. And uh, just taking in Dick Giordano's work here, just the purples, the oranges, the greens. So just some good complementary color scheme going on here. The highlight of the alien's face. He, he doesn't look very spooky, but he actually looks inviting and happy and maybe jovial and mischievous. And uh, it, it, you can see a little bit of a forlorn look of, should I be worried? Is, is something going to happen? But as we peruse the pages, we can see a few of the stories in here. There are always quite a few stories. This one's actually the uh, leader of the land is troubled that he doesn't have enough agriculture and enough uh, to feed his planet. And there's uh, miniature people that he goes between to talk to as a delegate. And then he goes off and, and tries to find a way. And we can see the feet here and how big they are. So big people helping little people and a happy ending as uh, little parcels of food were given to the miniature people and all as well. So these are the little stories. They're whimsical. Some are more serious. Some are more emotional. It's kind of look like emoji people here in this outer space book. Um, gold greed. So here we are. Aliens looking for gold and multiple eyes. They look like uh, something from Jules Verne's 
Thousand Leagues Under the Sea octopus characters here. So they, <laughs> interesting story, kind of kooky, kind of hokey. Space Saber. So you can see just that foreground, background, the faces here. That's kind of neat. Working here on the drawing board. So this one isn't really a space story. The first couple were. These are more like suspense story, a little bit of horror, but mostly uh, science fiction as we turn the page here. So that is in interesting to note because this is a Dick Giordano cover. His first job came with Charlton Comics in 1952. And he stayed with the company for quite a while until 1967 when eventually he went on to uh, DC Comics and did a lot of artwork there. Um, he also took with him Steve Ditko and Jim Aparo, who were working with Charlton at the time, and they too went to uh, DC Comics. So it's just to see how they followed. Uh, Dick Giordano did artwork, eventually became editor-in-chief uh, before leaving uh, Charlton for DC. And he had a start here. And just some terrific artwork, including this one in a view into space. And I hinted a little bit with uh, Jack Kirby with the uh, pseudonym uh, before as he worked with other artists. But let's give him his own debut in this theme of looking through into space, through the windows, through the visors, what have you. And uh, he did a lot of work for 2001, A Space Odyssey. And we always know him for his work with Marvel, with Captain America, uh, various characters, Iron Man. But this is an adaptation from a movie uh, from 1977. And you can see that Kirby-esque artwork, that hand in the sky, open the head, the angling, and of course the eyes and nose and Classic Kirby-esque mouth. It's so distinguishable, as a lot of comic collectors know from uh, following his work. So Jack Kirby actually edited, he wrote, and he drew everything in this book. Even the inset here kind of parallels the uh, title here. Uh, Intergalactica, the ultimate trip, toiling with the panels. And nobody drew, in my opinion, gears and machinery especially in the Fantastic Four, uh, than Jack Kirby. He always had that knack for drawing these complex, futuristic devices that we've never seen before. And this is no exception. This actually takes place in uh, 2040 AD. So that's uh, <laughs> interesting. We're making our way there. Maybe we'll get that advanced. But look at the afterburners here, the shading, that, that three-dimensional look like Battlestar Galactica. And keeping in mind, this is uh, from May of 1977. A lot of uh, science fiction is just taking off. Uh, any theme that can be uh, mustered, like Star Wars eventually gets into the picture. Uh, Star Trek is already there. So space is the action of the time. And look at that Jack Kirby proportion and dimension and twist right there as he's coming off the page. Just so Kirby-esque again. Can't use that word more and more often um, just to show here. This is just out of Fantastic uh, Four. That same look with the planets and that black and red mystical look right here and cosmic look just like when Silver Surfer is drawn, but this is for 2001 Space Odyssey, and it just looks like it's jumping off the page of Fantastic Four Silver Surfer. So he's definitely using his signature style. I wouldn't be surprised if Joe Sinnott was behind him inking it, but it happens to be from Mike Royer who inked it, not his longtime Joe Sinnott who would follow him up with the ink uh, right here. Kind of looks like uh, from AIM, AIM, the uh, soldiers there, they used to battle Captain America, but see some resemblances. Wow, look at this. Oh my goodness, have to bring a close-up here. Look at the colors, the shading, the, the illumination 
uh, Jack Kirby. Even on the left side, as I'm pointing here, look at the right panel, that whole panel. This is what makes this comic book fun. Look at it as I split it here. I'm just lifting the page so you can see this and this. I mean, isn't that a lot of fun? This is where you're in another world right now, on paper. You're not even using electronics. So just enjoying that, looking at that. Remember to join Foom. It's always good. And uh, lovely Jack Kirby. A view into space like no other. So good. And now coming at you with more Marvel goodness. And we have one of my favorite titles, Shogun Warriors from 1979, March of 1979. And we're greeted by these large robotic Shogun Warriors that are controlled by people inside. And uh, here we have probably Raideen and the other Shogun Warriors. As they look through the visor here, you know, watching an asteroid hurtling down to Earth. Meanwhile, the uh, Demonicus, the mean tyrant, is saying, It's too late, Shoguns. I've already launched the giant meteor at Earth. So now there's a dilemma. How do they get there so fast? How do they thwart his evil, get rid of all these minions, and then stop that asteroid or meteor from hitting Earth? So Shogun Warriors, there's always... Oh, the adventure that we see. So here they are. They have to battle all these monsters and get their way out of there. Meanwhile, the asteroid is ticking away toward Earth. And the artwork here is by Herb uh, Trimpe, best known for his works with the, the Incredible Hulk. And uh, Herb Trimpe also drew Wolverine and that iconic cover that we always know. And there's his name at the bottom. And so he took a large role in this short-run comic of 2021 issues uh, designing this while working with uh, creating The Incredible Hulk. So he's very talented. And he actually joined Marvel in 1967. And he worked with them until 1996. So it's a long tenure. He was laid off uh, when Marvel uh, had to file for bankruptcy in 1996. And he did some teaching and some other jobs and eventually got back into uh, doing his work with uh, art and cartooning and, and such things like that. But Shogun Warriors with uh, Kenji Odashu and the different characters of, that uh, make up, as you can see here, they control the big Shogun bots and another view into space. Just love it. Great 80s action. So it went from the 50s to the 60s to the late 70s. And um, I think his work is great. Um, I love Shogun Warriors. And I hope you do too. Let's put Marvel away and give D DC or National Comics, DC, a chance. And one of my favorite uh, shows to watch on TV in the 90s was Star Trek The Next Generation with Jean-Luc Picard and Commander Data, two of my favorite characters. And of course, uh, one of the iconic uh, nemesis, the Borg. The Borg always seeks to assimilate all cultures and, and races and people to create and make them a cybernetic race. Uh, but of course, the Federation, the Enterprise, and Captain Picard is not going to let that happen. So just a beautiful view into space here as we see this rectangular outlook and the controls again, this time the futuristic ones of the shuttlecraft of the USS Enterprise. 1701D, of course, and you can see all the action and space going on. Just love this cover, and I love the series. I really enjoyed it, and I still enjoy it when I see some reruns, especially when you see the Enterprise whizzing by, and uh, Commander O'Brien, he's in charge of teleportation, kind of like Scotty and beaming him up. The Doctor, Dr. Crusher, and uh, Jordy LaForge, who is the engineer of the ship, who's always working in the engineering room, saying, in five minutes, it'll be back online, so in case there's a power outage, 
Um, you have the Klingons, of course, Commander Riker. So this is a different story uh, outside of the TV series. But I like how the panels are laid out. I like how the characters are portrayed in here. Just the right amount of text and the bubbles. And just enjoyable to see the uh, action of what they're doing. Temporary command of the bridge as uh, Captain Picard is joining the exploration. A little right down here, some foot, photon torpedoes taking, taking some hits to the uh, board cube. So, again, uh, DC's adaptation with the series here is great. This is from July of 1993 in issue number 48. A view into outer space with the great Captain Picard and Commander Data. And we can't talk about space without leaving out Star Wars. And this is a beautiful cover, the Marvel adaptation from February of 1978. And here we have another viewer uh, window looking out into space. And this time R2-D2 and 3PO are looking helplessly at their uh, compadre, Luke Skywalker, before... Uh, beast in what is called death game so kind of like a tournament of sorts where it's man-to-man -man action and fighting and uh, they're looking through the viewer here uh, at every step of the way beautiful artwork by Carmine Infantino and Bob Wyasek and we're greeted in true late 70s fashion with space explosion a little uh, spider-man toy on the side here and Star Wars was really captured well by uh, Marvel. You can even see Princess Leia in the corner, the movement, the action. Just a great book, looking out into space. And uh, further in the book, we were introduced to the creature with these thorn daggers that he has here, uh, fighting uh, Luke Skywalker, kind of ill-equipped. And uh, has like a saucer disc to throw and using a maze. And we find the Hulk. We also find Thor uh, time and again in these type of tournament style battle. And Marvel kind of used that in this uh, issue, number 20, uh, about the uh, fight in action there. So you can see some parallels in the way that Marvel does it. And just look at that. And as we look through the book here, we see the viewer there looking into the action and just uh, also some introductions of the droids working in the background. Introduction to Master of Kung Fu. So this book is fun filled with action. It was a true companion to have as you're looking at the movie, watching it, enjoying. And it, another a book that fits the theme that we have going, looking out into space. Thank you, Star Wars. And we'll finish our parade, if you will, of looking out into space with uh, two modern Charlton books, uh, Space Adventures again, one of my favorite series of all of collecting, aside from the superhero genre, is Space Adventures. And this is number five and number nine, uh, Charlton Comics. And here we have Jim Aparo, one of my favorite artists there, and also Steve Ditko on the left-hand side. You can see, just like we saw in the previous ones, the looking out into space with the moon. This time, a gigantic alien looking down at the spacecraft that landed in the shuttle bay of the of the uh, spaceship machinery galore dials and different items here same thing on this side the crew is working inside the the ship to to control and see what they see here he looks like he's ready to triumph as uh, the moment of triumph has come at last we have the ultimate weapon the power of the magnet is too great even for the clever earthlings to combat but of course they should never underestimate earthlings and you can see uh, steve ditko's 
artwork. This kind of looks like his early ones when he used to work for Marvel, Marvel Fantasy, the first issue. Kind of like, I think I've seen him before anyway. Um, but you can see the a magnetic pull pulling all the space debris, rockets, saucers, and things toward, uh, toward Earth. So Charlton Comics, always great. And this is from 1969, January. Thank you, Steve Bitko, for another great beauty. And a happy ending. I always uh, enjoy how his career moved uh, from different companies through the ages, from Marvel, Charlton, DC. It's just uh, amazing to see that. And that's uh, a wrap-up of the View into Space theme. I hope that everybody enjoyed that and got a, had a chance to look at something different and something else and to be inspired. Thank you again for watching and be well.